Dan, welcome. Great to see you again. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, we're looking forward to a, a great discussion today and how we're going to change the world with technology and, uh, and the heat treat industry. It's, uh, it's nice to be able to talk to you again in our third edition. It's hard to believe that we've got here to a, a third one for our e-seminar. Um, how have you been? Great to see you. Well, first of all, Tom, it's a pleasure to see you as well. Uh, catch up on different things as we did this morning. And uh, uh, yes, all is good. Uh, life is good, both personally and professionally. And that's all we can ask these days. Good, good. Well, uh, we're going to have some, uh, some tough questions today, but I think you're going to really embrace them and, uh, and some good content for the, for the folks that are joining us today. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and, uh, and get into our first set of questions, okay? I'm looking forward to the challenge. <laughs> okay. So technology and innovation and the e-vehicle e market, electronic vehicles, um, they seem to be here to stay uh, with, with obviously some new regulations that are, are forthcoming. Uh, maybe we can talk about uh, how that's changing uh, and, and maybe how the, the materials are impacted with those changes and, uh, and how Heat Treat's going to step in and maybe help folks throughout this transition. Well, it'd be my pleasure. I think that we've talked about electric vehicles for uh, several years now in each of these e-seminars and uh, uh, I think that uh, technology is moving forward and things are changing in the industry which is something I think that everyone listening to this uh, seminar should be interested in uh, and they're changing very fast these days uh, I think the, the biggest thrust and we've talked about this in the past is we've talked about that infrastructure investment has to be there to support the electric vehicle industry. And there are several other technical challenges that we need to talk about as well. But I think what I'd like to start with is, interestingly enough, make sure everyone's aware, especially for those not, uh, not living here in the United States, that the state of California has now imposed a very interesting law, or they've made a, a new law, that basically says they're going to ban the sale of uh, fuel-fired uh, or fuel vehicles, meaning uh, gasoline or diesel-powered uh, trucks and cars, as of 2035. Uh, so as a result of that, they're looking at either hybrid technology or electric vehicle technology. And I think this is really, Tom, a, a, a portend of things to come. Uh, I think you're going to find a number of other states following suit. And I think the driver of this is the recognition that uh, there is a global climate change happening. Uh, we're seeing hotter uh, temperatures than normal throughout uh, North America. Uh, we're seeing um, uh, water, uh, whether it be rivers or lakes, starting to dry up. We're seeing the effects or the early effects of, of some of this climate change. So in order to address that and keep uh, uh, CO2 emissions down and things of this nature, uh, people are looking toward electric vehicles. So uh, we're seeing laws change. Uh, I think we're seeing a huge investment, a research and development investment, and a manufacturing investment in batteries and battery production. Mm -hmm. uh, I know companies are spending huge amounts of money uh, to set up uh, battery manufacturing facilities, plants. And uh, we're seeing, uh, or we're going to see, the fruits of that in uh, a renewed emphasis on electric vehicles. So I believe not only is there regulation issues, but there are technology advances in the area of batteries that are going to really affect the popularity of electric vehicles within the United States. The government has chipped in by improving the infrastructure, the recharging stations. And there's also technology afoot to actually have the electric vehicles recharge as you're driving them, similar to a gasoline or diesel powered car or truck today. So I think those innovations that are going to come in the next decade are going to change, at least changing my perspective on how the electric vehicle market will be looked at and viewed these days. I think you're going to see an explosion within the next decade 
of the purchase of electric vehicles, certainly hybrid vehicles, but I, I believe it's going to go all the way to electric vehicles. Mm. And what you're, you're going to be looking at, and what is interesting to me about this whole change, is the fact that uh, you're obviously going to want to have as lightweight a vehicle as possible because this means the batteries are going to have to work less, if you will, or produce less energy to power the vehicle. So I think you're going to see changes either in lightweight steel, you're going to see uh, more aluminum and magnesium, you're going to see, uh, or lightweight metals, if you will, um, and you're going to see, uh, I believe, more powder metal uh, in an automobile than you've seen in the past. So I think that, you know, we've gone from a cast iron engine block, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually at a trade show seen two people just simply pick up a, a magnesium engine block off the table and move it as if it was a loaf of bread. <laughs> so uh, as a result of that, um, these technologies are going to push the materials in a new direction. And I think uh, uh, it's going to have a tremendous impact on what we're able to heat treat these days. Uh, we rely on a lot of the heat treatment of a lot of different automotive components mm -hmm. to fuel our industry, uh, the heat treating industry. Uh, I think commercial heat treaters in particular are going to uh, have to become very adaptable, if you will. Uh, and I know we're going to talk in, in a few moments about additive manufacturing. And I think that's another, uh, another adaptation that the heat treat industry will have to, uh, have to adopt to, if you will. Uh, but from an electrical ve electric vehicle standpoint, I think that um, all the dominoes are being set up to be knocked over, if you will, in one false swoop. Mm -hmm. We've got the um, government regulation. We've got the government investment in infrastructure. We've got the private industry sector uh, contributing to uh, research and development on battery life, uh, battery size, and downsizing of the vehicle uh, without compromise of safety, I'll mention. Of course, now, how uh, you could almost say that uh, the automotive is taking a page out of aerospace book with reducing weight for the vehicles and, and be, to be able to let the batteries perform and, and last longer and go further. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still waiting for the first carbon-carbon composite, uh, <laughs> composite automobile, if you will. Uh, Corvettes, not to, not to name a particular type of vehicle, but you know, had fiberglass bodies or have fiberglass bodies for years. Um, so I think that some of the composites and plastics and things of this nature are going to see uh, continued use in those areas. But most heat treaters, unfortunately, we haven't found a way to heat treat carbon-carbon composite fibers or, or fiberglass, if you will, in a, in a standard commercial heat treat, so we haven't gotten there yet. Interesting, interesting, very, very good points. Now, I, I, I made a point that I wanted to ask you, how's that going to, uh, this, this transition, because a lot of markets will, will pick up on newer technologies from different segments. Where do you see uh, this, uh, this e-vehicle revolution sort of uh, impacting other markets? Do you see that uh, you know, transitioning? Oh, absolutely, because first of all, the automotive industry around the world has a, a, a tremendous contribution to economies, um, both here in, in North America and, and also in Europe and, and even in Asia. So as a result of that, as the automobile industry, the automotive and truck industry, uh, as it changes, if you will, you're going to see uh, a real impact on different economies. Um, what, what's amazing to me about the whole electric vehicle market is we sat here three years ago, if you will, saying, well, we wish it were true. And then last year we said, we hope it's true. And now three years later, we're saying it is true. So I, I think we, we cannot stop and we don't want to stop the advancement in this technological area. Uh, but I think it's going to have a huge impact. I think that 
that heat treaters have to be aware that they have to add flexibility uh, to their systems. And captive heat treaters uh, have to recognize what parts of an electric vehicle are heat treatable and which aren't, where they want to get into and how they want to manufacture today. So I think you're going to see a change in this industry over time. Uh, I will add one additional insight uh, is the fact that because at least here in North America, we've put renewed emphasis, if you will, on bringing manufacturing back onshore, as we say. Mm -hmm. I think the impact to the heat treating community as, a, as an overall percentage won't change, won't dip. I think it's going to continue to grow. But I do think that the reliance on, the heavy reliance on automotive uh, uh, component manufacturing and heat treating is going to change pretty dramatically. Well, I agree, and uh, it's here to stay, and we all need to adapt and, uh, and adjust our techniques so that we can uh, you know, absorb the, the transition and the changes. So, great points. Well, just think about the noise. Mm -hmm. We won't know what to do anymore if we don't hear an engine knock every now and then. So I hear they even pump sound through the vehicle so that you can hear it coming. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I want to drive with noise as the phrase goes. Well, good, good. Um, any, other, any other points you think that... Uh, that are relevant? Well, I, I think that there are other industries that are going to benefit from some of the um, R&D efforts, for example, with batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the uh, interesting aspects that people forget is, one, at least here in North America, one of the largest contributors to pollution are actually lawnmowers. Everyone's out there all summer mowing their lawn, mm -hmm. and most of them are fuel fuel fired if you will or fuel uh, fueled um, using mix either gasoline or mixtures of, of gas and oil and uh, merrily smoking away and sending up uh, sending up fumes in the environment mm -hmm. well we're starting to see advertised on television and other places that there are now uh, electric or battery powered uh, lawnmowers and I think that uh, the lawnmower industry is going to be uh, another industry that is going to significantly benefit mm -hmm. uh, from battery development. Uh, there are many other applications, but I think those are two that stand out in my mind. Well, I'll just stick with my John Deere at the moment, and we'll see when they change the, their, their platform. But uh, interesting, Dan. Very, very interesting. So. Okay, so let's get into the second topic. I want to, and, and, and we like to coin this phrase, to machine or not to machine? Is that the question? Uh, and you touched a moment ago on the, uh, the expansion and the additive manufacturing and some of the powdered metals. Uh, perhaps you can talk now about uh, the machining applications and, and how that's being impacted and how you know, the, the new uh, materials and associated with powdered metals and, and 3D printing are gonna take off. Yeah, this, this is a really, difficult subject for me. Uh, my father was a machinist for 45 years. I spent time as a child in the machine shops of this world. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very comfortable machining things. Coolant, uh, oils, right? You know, it's... Of course. Uh, uh, for some reason, washing your hands in, in oil just made sense to me as a kid. <laughs> uh, but the idea being the fact that the world, uh, it is changing. So uh, to machine or not to machine, uh, I believe, is no longer the question. Uh, additive manufacturing is going to change the landscape. Uh, and it's going to have, I think, it's another technical area that's going to have a, a profound impact, if you will, on, on the heat treating industry. Uh, you know, we often don't remember that uh, heat treating uh, also involves several other uh, what I'll call thermal processes. Brazing is a good example. Uh, somehow we, we associate and disassociate brazing with, uh, with heat treating, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we do the same thing in the world of powder metal. When we talk about sintering, we often uh, detach it, if you will, from the world of heat treating. Mm -hmm. But it is a thermal process. Uh, we think of sintering when we have to heat treat 
a, for example, harden or carburize a sintered part, if you will, or do a carbon restoration cycle on a sintered part. But we tend to exclude sintering from the general category of heat treating, mm -hmm. which to me is a mistake, the same with brazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so as a result of that, one of the things that, that heat treaters are going to have to learn is that additive manufactured parts are going to wind up being produced in small manufacturing cells. Mm -hmm. And the interest today is not to have a large heat treat to support those individual manufacturing cells but to turn around and put the heat treat equipment, the sintering equipment, if sintering is the answer to that, right in the manufacturing cell. Now there's five or six different technologies for additive manufacturing. We don't know which group of them will wind up being the preferred technologies. But it just makes sense that if we do additive manufacturing rather than, I'll call machining, reductive manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, it just makes sense. We're, we're saving metal, first of all. We're building a component uh, out of a material or material mixture which can be quite flexible. Mm -hmm. And we're getting the exact shape, performance based on design that we're, we're looking at. So as a result of that, whether it be, and, and we've seen this in the past, uh, we've seen uh, uh, conventional gears, for example, uh, in transmissions go to powder metal gears in transmissions and other, in other areas. Mm -hmm. Powder metallurgy has made quite a number of inroads. Um, but I think you're going to see that in the additive manufacturing world, uh, they're going to make even a greater <coughs> impact. So the heat treaters out there have to understand that um, they've got to embrace this te new technology and contribute to it in ways that will help it to grow. Um, one of the things that's interesting about powder metallurgy, and I've been involved in it for, ooh, I hate to admit about 50 some years now, but it's true. Um, you know, years ago, powder metal, um, um, was, was just not all that good. Mm -hmm. When we made something out of powder metal, um, we had trouble with density. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as opposed to getting full dense or something around 7.87 grams per cc cubic centimeter, mm -hmm. uh, we were getting densities that were in the 7.0, 7.2, mm. 6.8 range. Um, well, today, uh, whether it be uh, metal injection molding or ceramic injection molding technology or uh, additive manufacturing, we're seeing densities that are uh, in the 7.5, 7.7 seven, seven range. Um, we also have to remember that uh, from conventional press and center to metal injection molding to additive manufacturing, the particle size has gotten finer and finer and finer. So as a result of that today, you know, we take a look at a 40 or 100 mesh powder mm -hmm. or even a 300 mesh powder or higher uh, as being something that we can, we can use and, and create a component with. And as I understand that, the, the reduction in the Particle size often is helping improve the flow characteristics of the powder as it's being distributed, um, and and that also uh, is is a need for the industry, and thus materials uh, need to be need to be processed differently. Sure, and in the world of powder metallurgy, it's all about density. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can approach full density, um, we can we can get all the mechanical properties and the other properties that wrought metals have. And I think what's exciting about the additive manufacturing world is not only the uh, variety of different shapes and the diversity of components that can be manufactured, but the quality of the components that can be manufactured at a significantly reduced cost. Now I know there's three industries that are driving additive manufacturing. Uh, two are rather obvious and perhaps one is not. 
but the first one is the aerospace industry which is a, a big driver of, of it. The second is the medical industry with the implantables in the human body, hips, knees, shoulders, and things of this nature. But the third, interestingly enough, is the hardware industry. <laughs> the hardware industry is looking at additive manufacturing for tools and fasteners and other devices where heretofore we had never even considered that. Um, so um, a number of companies and a number of uh, industries are investing in additive manufacturing. And I would say that, uh, believe it or not, uh, additive manufacturing today actually has more R&D dollars invested in it than even the automotive electric vehicle market that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, the EV market, I believe, is is uh, gaining ground rapidly and will actually surpass the R&D dollars sent, spent on uh, additive manufacturing. But you're going to see a, a whole family of additive manufacturing uh, products out there. Mm -hmm. So for, for captive heat treaters and commercial heat treaters, again, the, the message is change. Uh, it's not going to be the same old, same old that we've done time and time again. It's going to be uh, a brave new world out there, and we're going to have to adapt to it. Yeah, it's it's quite the. Uh, it's it's not a niche market anymore. Uh, it's it's developed and maturing. Uh, I think we still have some more room to grow, um, but uh, but not a niche market anymore. Well, and I think the other thing, Tom, that it, uh, in, I, I say this with a heavy heart, in a mm -hmm. sense, um, but uh, one of the things that's also changing is the product life cycle, the mm -hmm. expectation that the consumer has for the life of a product. Uh, years ago, products were manufactured or engineered for life. Mm -hmm. Today, that's just not the case. Today, they have what I like to call engineered obsolescence of a product. Mm -hmm. Today, we decide that, that um, um, whatever we're purchasing has a finite life. It may last us one year, two years, five years, ten years, but no one is expecting it to last for a hundred years anymore. Mm -hmm. No one is expecting it to be uh, as rugged or as sharp or as, uh, oh, oh, we'd like it to be, but we're, we're making uh, compromises. And interestingly enough, th this started um, uh, many, many years ago, uh, probably over 40 years ago, when we started to rely more and more on plastics. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to give uh, the audience a little perspective, you've probably grown up in the world of plastics. I grew up in the world of metals. Mm -hmm. Plastics came along circa the late 1960s, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, as something that the industry started to pay attention to. A glass is not named a glass because it was made out of plastic. We'll, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but, I, but I think what's happening here is as the life cycle changes, uh, people are expecting less they're still demanding the same reliability, mm -hmm. the same durability, the same quality, but their expectation of it to last, last a lifetime just isn't there anymore. So I think additive manufacturing, I think the bar has been lowered, not necessarily intentionally, mm -hmm. but the bar has been lowered and it's easier to get over the top of the bar uh, than it's ever been before. So I think that's a contributor. Well, I think you've you've addressed that to machine or not to machine. It's an open it's an open market now for for both technologies, and there's certainly a big place for additive. Uh, and 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 what I do, it's nice to see this new market and, and how the heat treat world can can support. All right, Dan. So you mentioned a bit about onshoring a moment ago, and uh, there's a big push uh, with a lot of the things happening in today's world um, that is leading to bringing manufacturing back in this, in in inside within countries' own manufacturing capabilities. Um, maybe you can touch on some of those, uh, those trends and impacts to uh, the, the, you know, the materials market and, and what's going on with 
a lot of this onshoring nowadays. Sure, and it's exciting. It's an exciting area to talk about, Tom, because I think one of the things that uh, uh, is interesting to me is the fact that um, uh, I've seen it go from um, our having the capability in North America to manufacture and be self-sufficient mm -hmm. to where we became more of a service-oriented society to now the pendulum is swung again and we're becoming more of a manufacturing society. Uh, part of this, I think, was due, and, and if there's any silver lining, if you will, to all the unfortunate deaths that happened with COVID, uh, but the recognition that within a pandemic, we didn't have the, uh, the supplies we needed to take care of the general public if you will, mm -hmm. that we had to bring these, uh, these capabilities back within the various, the, where various countries, whether it be the United States, Mexico, Canada, we had to be, or whether it be a country in, um, uh, in Europe, whether it be a country in Asia, uh, we all needed to have the capability of manufacturing certain products. Uh, I think we touched in last year's seminar, but I'll mention it again, mm -hmm. that during the pandemic there was a, a uh, there was a need to have cotton swabs mm -hmm. to take samples to check if you you had the COVID virus or not. And interestingly enough, there was only one manufacturer in the United States of cotton swabs. Just one. Just one. And I and I didn't realize that. It just <laughs> it blew my mind when I heard it. And recently, we've had a um, uh, uh, we've had a crisis, if you will, in the manufacturing of, of baby food mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, milk and things of this nature. Um, it just blows my mind that we shut down one plant in one state, and we suddenly can't find any baby formula on the shelves anymore. Um, so uh, we've recognized this as, as a nation, if you will, and I think all the, uh, all the nations of the world have recognized it, that we have to have or we have to be as self-sufficient as we can be. Not because we want to discourage trade with foreign partners, mm -hmm. but we want to have a certain uh, basic capability within each of our own countries. Uh, and this is not only focused uh, uh, on, uh, on consumer products, but even in the military defense area. Um, I saw an interesting statistic the other day, which, which again blew my mind. But um, the U.S. spends more, the United States spends more on the military defense segment than the next nine largest countries in the world. I thought that to be a, a, an amazing statistic. We, se we spend, if I remember the number right, almost a trillion dollars on military and defense these days. However, a lot of our electronics, a lot of our um, capability relies on, uh, on offshore partners. Right. And the country has recognized that this has to change. So the good news is that more and more American companies more and more uh, companies in Mexico or Canada are realizing that they have to have the capability to support their populations uh, through fundamental manufacturing. So it's coming back. And once that decision has been made, um, we're going to see, a tr uh, again, a growth, and I think it will be a tremendous growth, in, in heat treating across the board whether it be atmosphere heat treating, whether it be vacuum heat treating, whether it be induction hardening, whether it be the use of industrial ovens to process different materials. Uh, we're going to see a growth w which is good for equipment manufacturers, of course, like yourself and mm -hmm. others, um, but it's also good for um, all of the people that do heat treating out there. Mm -hmm. So in certain industries, we're going to see them shrink in other industries, we're going to see them grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm very excited about bringing things back onshore 
and what we've been capable of doing. I've been seeing in a lot of the news uh, the, the, the CHIPS Act, if you will, and, sure. and, and the semiconductor issue, the issue that we experienced with the supply chain. Uh, maybe touch on a bit of that if you can, because that impacts a lot of, well, I mean, even how we build the equipment. You know, um, there was the, the big demand and there was no supply. So uh, see, how's, that, how's that looking to shape up these days? Well, electronics, biomedical, mm -hmm. for example, optics, mm -hmm. are areas that although I don't have a great deal of personal expertise in, mm -hmm. are areas that we've relied on a lot of uh, other partners, if you will, throughout the world mm -hmm. to provide to us. Uh, pharmaceutical, by the way, is another one. Um, for all the drugs that Americans consume, mm -hmm. we don't manufacture many of them here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, I think you're seeing uh, decisions being made at the highest of levels to reinvest in, in setting up manufacturing to manufacture these types of products. And, and other products fall right in line. Uh, the manufacture solar panels, for example, and mm -hmm. other things. Um, the establishment of and manufacture of different medical devices. More and more of it is coming back uh, onshore, if you will. Um, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll give statistics I think I've given before, mm -hmm. um, but uh, just after World War II, so that would be in the late 1940s, uh, manufacturing represented 38.5%, uh, almost 40% of the uh, GDP, the gross domestic product. Mm -hmm. uh, it fell in the late 1990s to about 11% of the GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, it's growing every year. I think it's approaching 15% now. It's 14.7, 14.8%. Uh, so you're seeing, again, that pendulum swing and you're seeing the reinvestment in, in manufacturing. Uh, I'll mention one other fact that um, if you look at the, I, I followed some statistics about oh, a few years ago now, but interestingly enough, the average age of a machine tool uh, in the United States was something like 35 years. Uh, the average age of a machine tool, for example, in Japan was something like eight years. So the one advantage, if you will, of uh, sending manufacturing offshore before we bring it back onshore is the fact that we, we have finally um, obsoleted our, some of our manufacturing capability and we'll have to buy new. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an equipment manufacturer, I see you sal salvating over mm -hmm. there. Just can't wait for that. Yeah. Um, but I really believe it to be true. Um, and when we talk in a couple of minutes about uh, maybe the change between different heat treating technologies, the use of induction, the use of vacuum, uh, and the use of atmosphere equipment, uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about how that's being driven uh, by this idea of bringing more manufacturing back. Well, we certainly know that the uh that the country embraces the idea of bringing the manufacturing back, and I know that I do, so uh, we'll certainly do our part to help support those activities. So, so very good, very good points. Um, and there is a transition in the workforce, even, even without the onshoring, I would say, Dan. Um, but with the onshoring and, and the, the difficulties we can even say about the uh, hiring in today's market, uh, let's talk about how that transition is taking place and, um, and what companies can do to, to embrace this, uh, this new bit of work and, and the challenges associated with the, with the workforce. Yeah, I think, Tom, that's, that's a very good point. I think this whole idea of of workforce transition is an important one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things we're looking at, uh, even around the world, is the fact that it's being more and more difficult to get workers into the manufacturing sector. And uh, that's very true here in North America, very true in the United States. Um, and, and interestingly enough, uh, part of that is fueled by the fact that um, there are, uh, uh, oh, I hate to use this, I don't want to be too philosophical here, but it seems like we're getting two types of people in the world. 
Uh, on one hand, you're getting people that like to get their hands dirty. And on the other hand, you're getting people that want their hands nothing but clean all day. Mm -hmm. So you're getting this division in the workforce between people that are willing to get their hands dirty and those people that are willing not to get their hands dirty, if you are, don't want to get mm -hmm. their hands dirty. Uh, so a lot of people are looking at, um, at jobs in factories as, gee, it's very unappealing to me because I, want, I don't want to get my hands dirty all day. I don't want to work in a dirty, smoky, smelly heat treat department, for example. The good news for people out there is that heat treat departments are seldom dirty and noisy and smelly and, and everything today. Um, but one of the other things uh, when we talk about it is the fact that um, um, engineers today want to be engineers, if you will, and do less hands-on work. Mm -hmm. uh, people with a great deal of, of skill, if you will, the trades, uh, whether they be mechanics or millwrights, whether they be electricians mm -hmm. or, or people interested or, or skilled in computers and electronics, um, they see opportunities, if you will, in servicing the general public as opposed to turning around and working in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So it's a real challenge for manufacturing to get skilled labor. Because today, a person who's a good pipe fitter or a good welder or really a sharp electrician is saying, I want to form my own little business. I want to service John Q. Public, as we call them. Mm -hmm. I, I want to serve people. And I can make a good living doing that, have my own hours, have my own, the time I work, the time I don't work, and, and how I spend my time. And I don't have a boss. Mm -hmm. The boss is me, <laughs> if you will. So th there's a lot of challenges to the workforce. And, and one of the things that has always intrigued me about heat treating is the fact that, that heat treating is a very controlled and predictable process. And for those people out there that are interested in the manufacturing discipline, heat treating is a very attractive place to work. But there's also a transition going on in the heat treat industry, which is helping to fuel um, uh, a larger workforce, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that is the fact that we're making our heat treat furnaces smarter. And I think this is huge when it comes to uh, uh, attracting a, a, a transitioning workforce, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, we're not looking for mindless robots today that can only load baskets uh, or, or uh, shovel parts uh, in, into a hopper, if you will. Uh, we're looking for a workforce that can think on their feet, that can problem solve. And, and the beauty of heat treating is that, that we are problem solvers, mm -hmm. um, uh, that can figure out the best way to, to heat treat something, the best way to make a component part. So I believe that uh, the challenges that heat treat uh, presents attract a, a large number of people that don't mind getting their hands dirty and people that don't want to get their hands dirty. Uh, and making our equipment smarter, easier to maintain, uh, easier to debug, these are all parts of, uh, uh, parts of, of helping to attract workers, if you will. Uh, we've seen a big strong uh, push uh, to that point exactly to make the uh, equipment easier to use, easier to operate, uh, makes the, uh, the maintaining of them, uh, helping them out with predictive maintenance platforms. and uh, So it's really uh, advancing those, those uh, functionalities of the systems and making it easier on the workforce so that they, we, that they won't mind working in the heat treat shop. You know? Well, and I probably shouldn't, shouldn't admit this and, and shouldn't say it out loud, but uh, interestingly enough, I happened to be at a, a SECO seminar, uh, oh, about five years ago now, I think it was, maybe a little less, but um, I remember I was at a seminar and uh, I was sitting in the audience when one of the speakers demonstrated 
uh, putting on the the goggles, as I call them. Hollow lens, yes. Yes, uh, and um, I remember sitting there saying to myself, uh, look, we don't play video games at work. Um, uh, and I said, boy, that's a, that's a foolish thing to do, to have this, uh, this idea to be able to see what the maintenance guy remotely is seeing. Mm -hmm. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that my perspective was wrong, that this would become a, a great tool, the idea to uh, be able to be in one location and remotely access your equipment that sits in another location. Mm -hmm. I, I've always been amazed that there are, there are great service people in this world, in the heat treat industry, that service and maintain heat treat equipment. They just need a little help now and then. Mm -hmm. And if they can get it directly from the factory by putting on a set of vision glasses, as I call them, mm -hmm. um, the better for the industry. Uh, so I think you're, you're seeing a lot of that. And that, again, is going to help anything that makes our job uh, easier, mm -hmm. that makes it uh, uh, more fun, um, is, is something that attracts us to that type of industry. Good. Yeah, it's uh, certainly an uh, interesting time, and, and we'll do our part to uh, make sure that it's a, a good working environment and producing quality, repeatable components. You know, we we need uh, we need that. Uh, those variables have to be held in check. So, and, and and if you're diversifying a workforce, it makes it more challenging to do. I would say. Well, as an equipment manufacturer, that's that's your job. Mm -hmm. Dan. So, uh, next topic: uh, drivers of technology. You know, there's there's a number of them. We've talked about additive. We've talked about the e-vehicles. Maybe we can talk about a little bit about defense and space in particular. Uh, those two markets, I see them as emerging, and uh, perhaps you can share some insights on how that's uh, developing and changing. Sure. And um, um, I guess I'll uh, uh, appeal at least to the. Uh, the people here in, in North America, I'll appeal to uh, a television show that was popular a few years ago, which was a show uh, by the name of Star Trek. You may or may not have heard of it. But uh, I don't know if you know that uh, the actual Star Trek, the, the Enterprise actually visited Earth uh, a number of years ago. <laughs> and um, I still remember that Captain Kirk came down uh, took one look at the place and said, beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> um, but with that, with that little metallurgy humor aside, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. uh, hey, it's Mission Mars today. We're going to Mars. I mean, uh, uh, I, wanna, I, I volunteer to be on the first ship going, if you will, <laughs> uh, or any of the ships me going. Too. Uh, but uh, uh, the exploration of space has always been a tremendous technology driver. Mm -hmm. And I, I think setting a goal, the, the goal is more important than the accomplishment of the goal. Mm -hmm. We set a goal years ago to go to the moon. Uh, we're still going to get back there one of these days. Mm -hmm. But we set a goal and we accomplished the goal. We've now set a goal of going to Mars and living on Mars. Mm -hmm. And I think this offers a, a tremendous opportunity to advance technology. Uh, one of the things I was always impressed with after we went to the moon was the fact that NASA had uh, uh, set up a whole, uh, a whole group of, of companies that then were spun off mm -hmm. uh, and serviced other industries such as the heat treat industry. And many of our um, uh, fixtures today, our carbon-carbon composite fixtures, our ceramic fixtures and things like this that are used in high-pressure gas quenching furnaces, yeah. uh, were, were basically spin-offs of that type of technology. Mm -hmm. So whether it be rocket engines, whether it be uh, the design of the space cap capsule using uh, aluminum lithium alloys and things of this nature for strength and light weight. Um, uh, I think you're going to see a tremendous movement or push of technology uh, based on space exploration. Um, from a military and, and defense standpoint, I think I'd be remiss if, if I didn't um, 
mention the 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 technology or what what's happening today and I guess uh, with the war in Ukraine. Uh, I won't dwell on it from a political standpoint or mm -hmm. make a personal message about it. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll speak just simply from, from a technology standpoint. Uh, but do you do realize that this is not the first time that the world has been at war in, in, um, uh, in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. uh, back in the 1850s, uh, we were uh, we were fighting on the Crimean Peninsula, if you will, uh, and in those days we had cannons, uh, the famous Charge of the Light Brigade, if you will. I won't quote the poem, although I could. Um, but what was interesting was uh, cannons had a range of something around 400 meters, mm -hmm. so it was it was relatively. Um, you know, 12, 1,300 feet. It was relatively um, a short distance, if you will. Today, we're talking about uh, artillery and rocket systems that can fire, you know, 30 kilometers, mm -hmm. 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 300 kilometers. I mean, uh, the military defense always pushes technology forward. Mm -hmm because we're looking for that next big innovation, whether it be in drone technology, whether it be in artillery shells or, or, or tanks or motorized vehicles uh, that are adaptable to various terrains and things of this nature. It's a very unfortunate situation to have to talk about it that way. I wish there were other technology drivers than war. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that some of the, uh, the greatest innovations that have ever happened, the greatest and the worst innovations that have ever happened, are, are due to war. Mm -hmm. It was at a, a recent seminar. It was uh, for additive, focusing on additive manufacturing. And now you have uh, deployments of additive machines in the battlefields where they're making their own parts to repair and replace components. Uh, so uh, you, you never would have thought to be able to create your own part. You have to, you know, call call back home or or machine it on on, on ships and and all kinds of different transitions. I would say with the materials and the availability of new technologies. Exactly. So Dan, we have challenges today. We have challenges tomorrow. Uh, we have to be properly tooled to handle these. What would you say is a, is a good approach or some of the emerging approaches to handle this? Sure, and, and uh, I think that's first of all a good question. Uh, we not only have uh, technological advances, but we have changes in the materials mm -hmm. that we need to support to support our lives, and support it, uh, that are manufactured by industry. Mm -hmm. um, I've always looked at it, Tom, and I know this is going to bring a smile to your face again, but I've always looked at vacuum technology as being the the best solution to our needs. Mm -hmm. It's not always the most cost-effective solution, but I think in, in these changing times, these evolving times with technology and materials, mm -hmm. that uh, vacuum is, is and, and will stay the preferred technology. Uh, you know, we just finished talking a, a few minutes ago about the workforce transition. And again, uh, if you think about the difference between uh, let's say vacuum furnaces and atmosphere furnaces, they're both very capable. But vacuum furnaces offer us an opportunity to work in a much, uh, a much cleaner, quieter, uh, some argue safer environment, if you will. Uh, so whether you're doing additive manufacturing or subtractive manufacturing, as, as sometimes we like to call machining, um, whether you're using wrought materials or, or powder metal material, mm -hmm. uh, whether you have bars or wire or rod or castings or forgings, uh, whether you're, you're hardening, whether you're carburizing, whether you're nitriding, whether you're uh, annealing and normalizing, we'd prefer to do those operations today in vacuum equipment. And I know that brings a smile to your face. Well, I spend a lot of time working with it, of course. But, it, yeah. but it's true. I mean, back, uh, back a number of years ago, and it wasn't too long ago, it was maybe the 1960s, 
Uh, we had maybe 75, 80% um, uh, of what was, uh, things that were heat treated were done in atmosphere furnaces. And, and by the way, a large percentage was also done in salt baths in those days. Um, but today, I think that percentage, uh, or this decade, we'll see that percentage, it's certainly under 50% today of atmosphere equipment, and it's, it's heading down toward, toward the low 40% range. Uh, 40, 42, 44% of the industry now uses atmosphere furnaces. Uh, the rest of the industry, about 3% of it uses salt baths. And the rest of it is made up with induction and, and vacuum, which are the two largest growth areas. We, we've talked about this in the past. But that trend is certainly going to continue. Uh, I know that uh, as we bring manufacturing back on shore, uh, companies are faced with a, um, uh, the interesting dilemma of uh, of what technology to purchase. Should it be an atmosphere furnace? Should it be a vacuum furnace? Now, a lot of this depends on, on what they're heat treating and how they're heat treating it. But as a, general, as a general rule today, people that don't have experience in heat treating that are bringing it back in house would prefer to purchase vacuum equipment because it's closer to the machine tools that they operate in their shops. Uh, people that have heat treating experience certainly are not afraid to put atmosphere equipment in place, mm -hmm. but are finding other obstacles that may make the, that investment short-term versus long-term. Um, uh, environmental uh, uh, emissions and discharges, environmental factors, um, here in North America, we often adapt the, uh, or adopt the, uh, the policy that uh, we're meeting the environmental standards because we're meeting the regulations that are imposed on us. So there is a different view uh, in, in North America, or at least in the United States, than maybe the rest of the world as to what defines uh, green, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, we look at it as, well, it's going to be green because we're, we're meeting government regulations and standards. But today, we're looking to go beyond that. I think most of us out there realize that the environment, the world, is, the world environment is changing. More hurricanes and typhoons today than ever before, stronger hurricanes and typhoons, um, uh, you know, the polar ice caps are melting, if you will. Uh, the U.S. has just um, um, uh, created their first position of the ambassador of the Arctic. I don't know where he's going to be domiciled, <laughs> but we'll ignore that, that fact. I'm not in government, everybody. But, but getting back to heat treating again, uh, we like the repeatability of heat treating processes. We like to be under control. Um, and one of the things that I think is so important is that uh, the use of vacuum equipment will give us the best chance to control the process or processes that we're running. Mm -hmm. So I see vacuum equipment as, as growing, unfortunately, because my heart still rests in the atmosphere heat treating world, but it's growing um, uh, uh, at the expense of atmosphere heat treating. Mm -hmm. Another thing that, that's going to happen, and it won't happen overnight, but I think it's something that, that everyone should be aware of, is this whole idea of safety in the workplace. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I've grown up and I'm so accustomed to see uh, uh, burn-offs out of furnaces, I take it for granted today. I'm so used to dealing with combustible atmospheres, whether they be hydrogen or endothermic gas, that uh, it's second nature to me. But we've got a whole generation of people that, don't, that are growing up that don't want to deal with, with safety. They don't want to be concerned for their personal safety in a, work, in a workplace. 
We also have other rules and regulations that, that are coming. Uh, I'll mention one of them. There's a, a, a new NFPA standard. The standard right now applies to ovens, but they're eliminating the exemption of oven construction and requiring ovens to have explosion ports on them because oftentimes you have volatile gases that are either evolved off or created in an oven process. Mm -hmm. um, the oven manufacturers had a certain class of ovens called, I believe it was a class A oven, that uh, didn't require explosion ports because it was built with the same rugged construction as furnaces. Mm -hmm. So as, a, as opposed to using lightweight panels, they were using quarter inch plate to build their shelves. Well, NFPA has come along and taken that exemption out and said they, they must, uh, uh, the new standard will say they must have uh, explosion ports. So you're telling me when I meet with my clients to ex mention explosion ports as the new uh, standard uh, these days. The, the, it, well, <laughs> it's, what, what's happening is if it's going to come to ovens manufactured out of quarter inch plate, mm -hmm. It's going to come to f the furnace industry manufactured out of quarter inch plate. Um, I don't know where or how we're going to put these explosion ports or how dangerous they're going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know that um, uh, it's something that is an example of a regulation that may be thrust upon the industry that we, we as manufacturers perhaps don't want or like, mm -hmm. but may have to adapt to. Uh, vacuum furnaces and, and the way they're constructed um, uh, avoid those issues, if you will. So right. there's a lot of rules and regulations. There's a lot of changes taking place besides technology and materials uh, that are going to change the face of the industry. So atmosphere has its place, but vacuum is, is gaining a lot more traction. Yeah, and, and uh, this comes as a, as a hard statement from a person such as myself because I love atmosphere heat treating. I, I cut my teeth on it. I grew up with it. I learned to control the beast. Mm -hmm. um, what's holding us back today, interestingly enough, is uh, a phrase I heard in a, in a technology seminar a few years ago quite a few years ago now. But atmosphere heat treating is the enemy we know. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, we, we've lived with it for so long, we know its problems. And knowing a technology's problems gives us a certain level of comfort. We feel we're in control, if you will. Mm -hmm. Even though we're trying to control the uncontrollable, we feel we're in control. And we viewed these up and coming technologies, uh, applied energy, uh, laser, uh, induction, uh, vacuum. We reviewed, uh, viewed them as the enemy we fear because they have their own sets of problems that we're unfamiliar with as an industry. Well, well that's no longer true. I mean, the first industrial, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the first industrial vacuum furnace was manufactured, okay, Tom, what year? Oh, I thought it was in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s. Well, I'm going to really date you now. It was uh -huh. 1929. Oh, geez. Just uh, so everyone's aware, I was not around then, <laughs> but I've actually seen the purchase order for the very first two uh, vacuum furnaces. Uh, interestingly enough, it was a company, a small company called Raytheon. I think they're in military defense today. Mm -hmm. uh, the order was the vacuum furnaces cost $400 each. Remember that, folks. <laughs> $400 each. The delivery was six weeks. And of course, customers being customers today, it said, please expedite. <laughs> so, Tom, your challenge is to build a a $400 vacuum furnace delivered in six weeks or less. <laughs> so you, you can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> uh, if you These days. That, if you tell me that. <laughs> but I think that that's the most significant thing that's happening. Um, people, uh, and, and let me just remind everybody of my definition of heat treating. 
It's the controlled application of time, temperature, and energy mm -hmm. to produce a predictable change in the internal structure or what metallurgists call the microstructure of a material. So the key words in that definition are predictable, controlled, and they happen inside the part, in the internal structure. So metallurgists predict what's going on, heat treaters control what's going on, and quality systems are ultimately responsible for did we do our jobs correctly. And, and to that point, um, it lends itself, at least with vacuum processing, to some of these newer materials, right? Um, you know, for example, some of the, uh, the higher alloy uh, materials. Maybe you could talk to that point and, and how those fit into the uh, grand scheme of things. Sure, and I think that's important as well. Uh, because I think that vacuum furnaces, as I said, give you the, the best control. Mm -hmm. But there is a new family of materials that are coming out. And these are what I like to classify as engineered materials. In other words, we're looking at the design. The, the design engineers create a design, and what we're looking to do is engineer a material that will optimize the performance of that design. Mm -hmm. And this new class of engineered materials oftentimes require heat treatments that are quite either quite involved or at higher than conventional temperatures. Mm -hmm. I'll use vacuum carburizing or carburizing in general as an example. Uh, in, most, uh, in most atmosphere furnaces, the, the carburization takes place somewhere between, I'll use Fahrenheit as an example here, 1,475 degrees Fahrenheit up to about 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. And what limits carburizing in an atmosphere furnace is maintenance. If you start to get over 1,750, 1,800 Fahrenheit, uh, all the alloy inside the furnace uh, has very short life. Mm -hmm and you, you get very high maintenance. In a vacuum furnace, going from 1475 to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit is, is simple. It's a walk in the uh, park. Even, even higher, as you know. Mm -hmm. But certain of these engineered materials today are carburized at 2100 Fahrenheit, 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. You, you cannot even process them in an atmosphere furnace. You wouldn't even think to do so. The highest atmosphere, it was a pit furnace, atmosphere pit carburizing furnace I ever saw ran at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And the guy who ran it was considered a, an absolute, absolute lunatic for doing it. But, but that's a, a different story for another time. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, some of these engineered materials, and, the, and there's a class of them, they're, they're lighter weight. Mm -hmm. You know, what we're, what we're ultimately as an industry is trying to do is we're trying to put a higher performance product in a smaller and smaller package. Mm -hmm. uh, the example we can quickly, that quickly comes up to, uh, to, to think about is you've got a laptop with you. Uh, years, years ago, you, you had a, a desktop computer. Mm -hmm. And in the IBM days, you had a, a bank of, uh, you had rooms of computers. Uh, that's no knock to IBM, but just the, the reality that you had a whole room set up with uh, computer banks. That transitioned to the desktop, then it went to the laptop, and now it's into the six pound, seven pound laptops. Mm -hmm. Very light, very mobile. Well, the same is, is ultimately true with, with what we're going to do with, with our heat treating. And vacuum gives us the flexibility to do that. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself, Dan. <laughs> that's, well, that's why you're here. So. All right, Dan, so um, we're going to make you do some predictions here uh, and, and look into that ever uh, foggy crystal ball. Let's gaze into it for a little bit and talk about how things are, are going in the future and, and, and what the impacts involved there. Here's a, a typical American phrase. Shucky darn, <laughs> I didn't bring my crystal ball with me today, but I can still remember what it told me this morning when I looked into it. Um, but seriously, the, the world of heat treating is changing, 
and anyone who listens to, to our discussion today will have recognized that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's changing in some very, very fundamental ways. Uh, I think we're looking at technologies that are uh, light and fast. Mm -hmm. Lean and agile is another word for them, versus something that is heavy and slow, which has been what we've, we've been accustomed to for the last, uh, oh, maybe 20 or 30 years, if you will. Uh, I think we have to be um, capable of producing smaller batches faster because ultimately that's going to improve the quality of the product that we're producing. Uh, so I think that, that what I see is the fact that, that heat treating, because of the technologies we've talked about, is changing. And it's changing more toward, I need to be agile and I need to be in control. I've often said this about quality. Um, for all the quality uh, control and all the quality assurance people that are out there, uh, I'm not anti-quality. But the quality is put into a product at every step of the process. The manufacturing processes, the raw material processes, the manufacturing processes, and the heat treating processes. So our quality control cannot be a static department that checks a part at the end of the process to see if it's good or bad. By the time it's checked at the end of the process, all the value is put in the product already. So what quality is and has to continue to be is a check at every step of the raw material manufacture, the manufacturing, and the heat treating to ensure that the performance is there. Today we are relying much more on our engineering skills to engineer a product, not to heat treat it with our fingers crossed and hope it's okay, but to know absolutely that if we control the process variables and we control the equipment variables, mm -hmm. we will have a positive outcome, we will have the performance that the product demands. Now, when I say that, there's a lot of people out there that said, wait a second, Dan, how come there's, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of recalls these mm -hmm. days? Mm -hmm. Everything from um, uh, baby swings to automobiles, if you will. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is the fact that, again, on those types of products, we failed to match the material, the design, and the performance together. We failed in our mission to produce a quality product for that period of time. Or we've, we've stepped boldly beyond where, where engineering should have gone mm. to create an engineered product that just can't perform its, its applica in the application it's intended to. So, so from my crystal ball standpoint, um, I see uh, being agile and being in control as, as very, very necessary. Now, let me break that down a little bit into the two um, typical market segments, if you will, for heat treating, the captive heat treater and the commercial heat treater. I think the captive heat treater, and if I can say this from, from my experience anyway, the driver behind captive heat treating is production. They want to take and make sure that they can produce the volumes, of course with high quality, mm -hmm. but produce the volumes that they need. If you look at uh, captive heat treaters, this is their main motivation for buying equipment. This is their main motivation for um, uh, th this is their main motivation, mm -hmm. if you will. That drives their profitability. So they are always concerned and aware of what capital equipment costs are, for example, but uh, that it, the cost is not the driver. Uh, so the, the captive equipment market is going to look at their workforce. They're going to look at a number of things that we've talked about here. 
uh, and decide on what's the best equipment uh, for not only the short term but the long term. Because like it or not, heat treat furnaces are going to last 40 or 50 years. That's four or five decades. Mm -hmm. That's a long time, a long lifetime, if you will. Uh, so in my crystal ball, uh, I view technology as a train that's moving along a track, stopping at stations along the way. So when you decide on a technology, when you select a furnace, let's mm -hmm. say, to, to put in your manufacturing uh, facility, you're getting off that technology train. You're stopping at the station. Mm -hmm. The trains are still passing you by, mm -hmm. but you're fixed in time and space with that technology. So the choice of that technology becomes extremely important. And I think the captive heat treaters are considering that more and more today. They're looking at solutions that will be around tomorrow with tomorrow's challenges that they don't even know what they are yet today. But they're looking at the challenges of tomorrow and saying, what equipment will, will still be functional when things change? And commercial heat treaters view it a little differently. They typically look at um, uh, having large capacity equipment. Uh, they need a certain amount of flexibility. Mm -hmm. I think some of these technological challenges will challenge the commercial heat treat market more than it will challenge the captive heat treat market. And that's a pretty bold statement. Yeah. But that's what my crystal ball tells me. And commercial people will have to also look at this technology train and say, do I want to get off only once at one station? Or do I want to get off for a short period of time and step back on the train to move to the next station or one of the stations down the road? So if you view technology as a train that's ever moving forward, it's only a matter of where you get off. And so I think the hard decisions for this industry are in front of us, not behind us. Which technologies in the equipment world do we, do we want to rely on to, to bring us there into an unknown future? Where, by the way, the uh, advancement of technology is not linear any longer. Mm -hmm. It's truly in this day and age exponential. exponential yeah. It's moving very, very quickly up and up and up. Uh, the quality standards, the design and performance standards, the life expectancies, everything is changing. So the, the, the ground is not firm under our feet any longer as, as consumers. And, and we look at this industry and, and we say that manufacturing has to keep pace with, with the latest and greatest tool, toy, technique. And that means being agile, that means being flexible. So that's what my crystal ball tells me. Very good. I, uh, I, I like the, where the future is heading and, and I'm glad that we're, I'm a part of it and then we'll continue to be. Um, so. That, uh, that concludes it for today, Dan. All the questions I have, I know that we could continue on for hours, uh, but I uh, want to thank you for your expertise, your, 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 your visions, your, uh, all good advice that, you've give, that you're sharing with us. And uh, it's always a pleasure to spend time with you, my friend. Tom, a pleasure. It's a pleasure is all mine. And uh, thank, uh, thank everyone for listening to this. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Great. That concludes the, the interview for today, and I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure speaking with my good friend, Mr. Dan Herring, the heat treat doctor, and uh, feel free to contact he or I if you have any questions, and uh, we'll be happy to help. Thank you.